Three and a half decades after the chilling and mysterious murder of 11-year-old French girl Cécile Bloch, the veil of secrecy was finally lifted by the revelation of DNA evidence. Unveiled alongside this newfound truth after the 35-year hunt was a horrifying connection. The same malevolent hand that took Cécile's innocence also stained France with the blood of other victims during the dark period from 1986 to 1994. To make it worse, the chilling revelation was that the very person responsible for this heinous act was a person that was supposed to be a guardian of the law, a gendarme and a policeman at the time of the murders. This is the tragic tale of Cécile Bloch, a story that will shatter your heart. It's the fateful morning of May 5, 1986. The universe seemed to conspire against 24-year-old Luke Block with the day kicking off on the wrong foot. At first his alarm clock didn't go off and to make matters worse, nobody in the Block household had the foresight to rouse him from his restless slumber. Luke, now in a mad dash to get to work, also had to make sure his young sister wasn't late to school. With a sense of urgency gnawing at his heels, he calls out to his little sister telling her to hasten her preparations for school as he hurriedly leaves the apartment. In those days it was common for children to go to school on their own. Every morning on the weekdays the parents Jean-Pierre and Suzanne Bloch would embark on their own journeys to work by 8 a.m. Luke too would depart the family apartment leaving just before Cecile who typically set off for her classes around 8.45 a.m. Lunchtime brought a cherished routine. Cecile would return home alone savoring a comforting bowl of soup before serenading the household with her beloved violin. This gifted young girl was a maestro of melodies and really loved music. She harbored an affection for dogs and also excelled at school. At noon, her loving mother Suzanne would routinely dial the family apartment to make sure her daughter got home safely and had taken her lunch. But on that fateful day, an eerie silence met her call. The girl didn't pick up the phone, and this would lead to a horrific revelation that would create many questions of what had truly transpired on this fateful day. Let me take you back to the moment Luke Block embarked on his daily journey to work. As he stepped out of the apartment, the darkness of the landing greeted him yet again. There was no light for the third consecutive day. Frustration coursed through him as his fingers fumbled in the inky darkness to find the elevator button. The only functioning elevator glided to a halt on the third floor and inside stood a well-dressed young man. This man, possibly in his late twenties, possessed an athletic build with a pockmarked face. Luke feeling a twinge of embarrassment, extended a cordial greeting then disembarked on the first floor the stranger wishing him a strangely emphatic good day. Something about this encounter struck Luke as peculiar. The man's politeness appeared excessive for a stranger, it was almost unnerving. In hindsight, Luke would recall the haunting final words uttered by this strange man, have a very, very good day. Little did he realize that in a matter of minutes this very man would perpetrate the unspeakable to his young sister that would forever leave a scar in his heart. The clock struck 8.20 a.m. and within the building the concierge perused a fresh newspaper while neighbors bustled about their morning routines. None among the building's residents could fathom that in just half an hour young Cecile would meet her tragic fate fate that awaited her lifeless form in the shadowy depths of the building's basement, a staggering three floors beneath the building that was once her peaceful home. Suzanne, her heart sinking with each unanswered call, began to entertain a glimmer of hope that Cecile might be at her friend's house. She dialed the number praying for a reassuring voice on the other end but her fear intensified as her friend confirmed the chilling truth. Cecile hadn't been to school and she hadn't seen her that day either. 
By 1 p.m., panic had engulfed the parents driving them to sprint back into the apartment, their frantic voices echoing as they desperately called out for their beloved daughter. Cecile was nowhere to be found. Suzanne's gaze fell upon her daughter's absent school bag, a sign that she had indeed departed, but to where? Meanwhile, Jean-Pierre initiated a series of agonizing calls to local hospitals. Their anxious pleas met with the same heartbreaking reply. No girl matching Cecile's description had been admitted. In the building's lobby, the parents beseeched the concierge to aid in the search for their missing child. With urgency fueling their every step, they raced to the police station scouring the nearby streets and playgrounds as they went. Cecile was known for her unwavering attendance at school and there were no significant issues at home to explain her absence. The question loomed large, why had she left and where had she gone to? The concierge, now joined by two concerned neighbors embarked on a painstaking search of the building, floor by floor inching their way downwards. But the haunting truth remained. Cecile had vanished without a trace. All that remained was to descend into the foreboding cellar. The first room they entered was empty and devoid of any answers while the second room stood locked. They then entered the third room, a chamber of forgotten clutter that obscured any immediate revelation. The room was a chaotic maze of forgotten possessions, a lot of junk from years past so densely entangled that nothing could be seen at a single glance. In a breathless moment a flashlight pierced the darkness casting a feeble glow upon the basement's desolation. At first glance it appeared vacant but just as they were about to retreat, at the corner of his eye, one man caught a glimpse of something amiss in the periphery, a grimy time-worn carpet that seemed to conceal something beneath it. He summoned the others, a glimmer of dread tugging at their hearts. Unfortunately they found who they were looking for but not the way they hoped they would find her. Outside the house, police cars and an ambulance had already arrived at the scene when Cecile's parents returned. They rushed past the gathered crowd in the basement. It was too late, the innocent life of young Cecile had already been taken her innocence brutally shattered. The wheels of justice began to turn as a relentless investigation was launched into the heart-wrenching homicide. The grim investigation unveiled a chilling timeline. The malevolent intruder had infiltrated the block residence lingering within its walls and shared a sinister 40-minute encounter with Cecile with witnesses testifying that he had departed the building at 9.20 a.m. They all echoed a hauntingly consistent description of the suspect. A dark-haired young man, aged between 25 and 30, his face marred by the cruel reminders of severe acne scars, the very same man who had exchanged strange pleasantries with Luke that morning. It was the height of rush hour, a bustling chaotic moment in the day when most would blend into the anonymous throngs. But this perpetrator displayed a chilling indifference to the world around him. Detectives concluded that he had lurked in the elevator waiting for Cecile before descending to the basement where he committed his heinous act. Drawing from the accounts of six witnesses and Luke's recollection, the police conjured a rough sketch of the malefactor which found its way onto the pages of newspapers across France. While investigators managed to secure the assailant's biological material and ascertain his blood type, the nascent era of DNA forensics limited their progress. The evidence, a tantalizing puzzle piece remained locked in a cold waiting silence as the promise of breakthroughs in forensic science beckoned from the shadows. Yet the revelations remained scant, leaving a trail of unanswered questions and a community haunted by uncertainty. Just a month prior, the city had shuddered at the news of a similar predator haunting their midst. 
a man bearing an uncanny resemblance to the malefactor now under investigation had assaulted an eight-year-old girl in an elevator, yet miraculously she had survived to share her harrowing tale with investigators. This brave child known only as Sarah recounted how the man had cunningly posed as a police officer during the ordeal. What sent shockwaves through the community were the eerie parallels emerging in three additional sexual assault cases. In these grim chapters, the assailant, employing the same sinister ruse, had targeted a 26-year-old woman and two young girls aged 11 and 14. Each victim had fallen prey to his apparent police identification card and the menacing glint of handcuffs, tools of restraint that he employed with chilling precision. The authorities were gripped by a sense of urgency. They grappled with the unsettling question. Was this a deceitful ploy to gain the trust of unsuspecting victims or was he actually a police officer? Their suspicions were stoked not only by the violence inflicted upon his victims but also by the chillingly calculated tactics he employed. A nagging intuition lingered among investigators, a conviction that this malefactor was no ordinary criminal. Their gut told them he was either a sworn officer or a gendarme, a belief that would later be chillingly confirmed. However, capturing this predator was far from straightforward as he continued to elude the clutches of justice with diabolical cunning. Despite widespread distribution of the sketch to the local population, it proved futile in unmasking the perpetrator. By the close of 1987, a sinister shadow had been cast over a number of crimes, all attributed to this man based on his distinctive appearance and chilling demeanor. The investigation remained in an agonizing deadlock for years swinging back and forth between closed and reopened status. In a cruel twist of fate, the latest DNA tests conducted in a bid for justice yielded inconclusive results shrouding the identity of the perpetrator in a veil of impenetrable darkness. Tragically, the parents of the young victim never lived to witness the moment of reckoning. Suzanne met her untimely end in a devastating traffic accident in 1989 while Jean-Pierre departed the world in 2011. Their hearts bore the heavy burden of never knowing the face of the monster who had stolen their beloved Cecile away forever leaving a haunting legacy of unresolved pain and injustice. The embers of the unresolved mystery began to rekindle illuminating the path for the determined cold case detectives. They uncovered a thread of evidence that sparked a glimmer of optimism. The killer, known to drive a white car, had once belonged to the prestigious Gendarmerie Nationale. His chilling history culminated in a final act of crime committed in close proximity to a Gendarmerie training center. The techniques he employed bore the unmistakable imprint of police and military training. In the year 2021, the police undertook a daring gambit. They summoned approximately 750 former gendarmes who had plied their trade in the Paris region during the period of the crimes. Among the summoned throng lay the very man who had eluded justice for so long who was beckoned for interrogation on September 29, 2021. The investigator's aim was crystal clear. To harvest the DNA of these suspects, holding fast to the fervent hope that the murderer might finally be unmasked among their ranks. The plot took a harrowing twist when on September 24, a summons landed in the hands of a man compelling his appearance for questioning on September 29. The demand extended further calling for the surrender of a DNA sample. But in a startling turn of events, the narrative pivoted on September 27 when the man's wife reported him missing. As the clock ticked relentlessly towards the fateful date the puzzle was far from complete. Two days later on September 29, 2021, in a quiet town in the south of France, tragedy struck in the form of a suicide. Francois Verove, a 59-year-old man, 
chose to end his own life leaving behind a farewell note that laid bare a haunting confession. Among its chilling lines it read, I admit being a great criminal who committed unforgivable acts until the end of the 1990s. In a heart-wrenching denouement, DNA tests bore witness to the grim truth. The man authorities had hunted relentlessly for years, the pockmarked man, the phantom predator stood unmasked as Francois Verov. However, a lot on the man's background remained cloaked in shadows. Born on January 22, 1962 in France, he had grown up under the stern gaze of a strict father, a stepmother and two stepsisters. His biological mother had succumbed to the ruthless grip of the flu. In his youth, he had harbored an unsettling fascination with horror movies, perhaps offering a glimpse into the darkness that would later consume him. The year 1983 saw Francois embark on a new chapter as he made the move to Paris and donned the uniform of the National Gendarmerie. By June 1985, he had exchanged vows in matrimony, taking it upon himself to construct a family home from the ground up, a testament to his ambitions. In the eyes of a former friend, he wore the dual masks of kindness and decency, but his temper lurked just beneath the surface, a volatile element that could erupt without warning. Behind this facade, however, lay a chilling truth. He was completely the opposite of the positive traits he may have portrayed to others. Four innocent young girls had suffered beneath his sinister hand miraculously escaping his clutches, all except for young Cecile Bloch. The depths of Francois' malevolence, however, did not stop there. The year 1987 bore witness to the cold-blooded murder of two adults, the 38-year-old Jill Politi and his devoted housekeeper Ermgard Muller. Armed with the crucial DNA evidence they had gathered, investigators embarked on an electrifying journey determined to unlock the secrets of a malefactor whose dark deeds seemed boundless. They fervently believed that his sinister trail of crimes extended far beyond those already uncovered compelling them to dive deeper into the labyrinth of unsolved cases hunting for the hidden connections that could expose the full extent of his reign of terror. Unfortunately, the earthly scales of justice may never weigh upon him for the atrocities he committed and it won't see retribution. The specter of his atrocities looms over him leaving the question of inevitable justice to the realm beyond. As the pages of this harrowing tale turn we are left with unanswered questions, wounds that may never fully heal and the haunting specter of a man who committed unspeakable acts. Francois Verov may have escaped the clutches of earthly justice but his deeds are etched in the indelible ink of infamy. Amidst the darkness there's a glimmer of hope, a testament to the relentless tenacity of those who sought answers and with the help of advancements of DNA technology the truth emerged from the depths of despair. In the afterlife, in the realm beyond, justice may yet find its elusive mark and the innocent souls forever scarred by his malevolence might finally rest in peace. In the shadow of these chilling revelations let us remember all those who suffered at the hands of this predator. Their memory lives on as a reminder that even in the darkest corners of our world the relentless pursuit of justice can be a beacon of hope. In the end, as we close this chapter of human frailty and malevolence, let us remember Cecile not for the darkness that took her but for the vibrant spirit she once embodied. For every life taken too soon there remains a legacy that defies the shadows, a testament to the unwavering hope that someday justice will prevail. May the souls of Cecile and all the other victims rest in eternal peace. If you found the video compelling, leave a like, comment your thoughts, share and subscribe for more videos.